Hi again, and we're still talking about yurt, uh, its origin, its history, its design, how it was related and relevant to nomadic lifestyle, and other things uh, uh, related to yurts and nomadic lifestyle. And in this video, we will be talking about how E uh, fits nomadic lifestyle and what is nomadic lifestyle because very often um, you hear just uh, kind of uh, fractured uh, type of information you say you, you hear that yes nomads used yurt and this is a yurt and this is what it's made of this is how it's used and that's kind of it living uh, outside the fact that yurt was just a part, a uh, very important, very uh, central part, but a part of this huge, larger uh, phenomena known as nomadic civilization. And very rarely people talk about what is this nomadic civilization, what is it about, how it was, uh, how it operated, what principles was it based on. And of course, this is a huge topic. Uh, it's not possible to cover it within just one short video. But I will give you a brief so that if you don't know about it, you have at least, you know, some sort of a general idea how it really worked on a uh, daily uh, operational level. So first let's take a look at the uh, household uh, and yurt itself. How it fit in, what uh, duties it performed, what was the inner life of it. Well first of all let's start with the fact that um, Yurts were mainly uh, considered uh, female territory because uh, inside of a yurt and its immediate surrounding is females uh, territory, females uh, area of responsibility and expertise. But everything outside of a yurt, the steppe, the mountains, the rivers, and etc., uh, hunting, wars, cattle, livestock, that's uh, men's duty, that's men's job. So maintaining yurts, owning them very often was uh, a privilege and the duty of women. So if we take a look at the anatomy of the yurt and its interior, we start obviously with entrance. And then as we enter inside, we see Oshak, which is a fireplace, uh, a very central and important and sacred and also functional uh, place where they would light fire because uh, being in the middle, it would uh, distribute heat evenly. Also, uh, it would help cooking and it will allow the... Uh, sm the smoke uh, exit through the uh, shanrak on the top. Uh, immediately before or, or after uh, the entrance, as you cross through threshold, as, as you uh, cross through a door, there is this uh, grass or soil area, meaning that they didn't put any platforms, there was no foundation. Yurts were raised immediately on, on the ground or on the grass. Now, uh, uh, I don't know uh, about Mongol yurts, Mongol gears. I've seen images and there is a name for wooden floor uh, for Mongol gears. Uh, it's just a round... Uh, flat round area made of wood uh, uh, made of uh, wood cut wood uh, that serves as sort of uh, foundation for for a year 
I don't know if, if it was traditional or whether it was introduced lately, but uh, Kazakhs didn't use, for the most part, didn't use any preparation. They would put their yurts immediately on a floor. I mean, on, on the grass, on the soil. And uh, right uh, next to uh, a door on your uh, on your left side on the uh, yeah uh, let's mention it here that every yurt had two sides men and uh, female sides men side was on the left and female side was on the right so as you enter and you go to your left <clears throat> you immediately enter men's side and right next to a door is, a, is an area where they would put a uh, lamp or, or other uh, uh, livestock um, calves and 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 colts and etc when they were if, if they were born in uh, cold condition and their life was threatened if they were if they were left outside if they could freeze or maybe some other dangers like wolves uh, very often they would put them inside a yurt uh, on this left side immediately uh, on the left uh, from the door and tie them to carriage and let them grow a little bit so that uh, they have uh, stand better chance uh, on the outside they would bring they would either eat the the grass on the inside or they would bring them some uh, from the outside so this was kind of like a nursery for for uh, for livestock children and uh, right next to that area again on the left was the horse equipment uh, uh, usually a chest where they would put saddles and uh, bridles and all other horse equipment also uh, this is where uh, uh, in older times they would also hang their weapons on carriage in the same exact area so this was kind of a men's spot inside a yurt where horse equipment and war equipment was stored together and it was convenient because being so close to entrance, it could be, it, it was one of the almost uh, the shortest uh, distance <coughs> for it being deployed in times of need. Uh, uh, next, we have area of house goods on the female side, and that includes... Uh, mostly uh, things related to cooking. Uh, there was a cupboard uh, uh, and bags uh, for 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 dishes. There were also uh, chests, uh, food chests, where they would uh, store their food. So everything related to provisioning and food was stored in that area number six uh, number seven is bed that would be uh, on the right side it would be a female bed and right across from it on the opposite side we can't see it on this particular uh, vantage point but there would be a men's bed uh, on the left on the on the men's side and number eight is the so-called tur, and that's an honor spot. So uh, uh, if there is no guest in the house, this is where the head of household would usually sit. But if there was an honorable guest, for example, a traveling poet or, uh, you know, a representative of nobility or a knight this is a spot tur that would that was des uh, reserved after such an such honorable guests 
Uh, number nine is Dastarhan, which is uh, either a table uh, covered with tablecloth, a low table, because people sit on the ground, so the table ha has to be low. Or maybe sometimes they would just uh, put the, um, the linen directly on the ground and eat off, off this linen off the ground. Also, it would be called Dastarhan in this case. And that's also very sacred. Uh, people were not allowed to step on it with their feet because that would be desecrating uh, the entire, you know, well-being of the household. So you have to be very respectful around Dastarhan. No silly games, no food fights, none of this nonsense was allowed. And finally, number 10 are chests. They're placed uh, across from the entrance. And this is where they would usually put uh, all of their uh, best possessions and belongings and also best of their bedware. And bedware was uh, highly richly decorated, so it created such a kind of a beautiful installation almost. Interestingly, uh, in Mongol gear, this spot across from uh, entrance was reserved for altar. Now, of course, uh, uh, everybody know that Mongols were uh, at least uh, si ever since the uh, creation of so-called Mongol Empire and later they switched to Buddhism. So they became uh, worshippers of Buddha. So this is where the altar would be put uh, where they would worship Buddha and their ancestors. Now, Kazakhs didn't have altar. Uh, the entire area of the yurt had uh, sacred spots. There were a lot of rituals related to it. Uh, it's, it's just a whole another science in itself how a yurt was used and the, the and it's sacred and and it's religious uh, meaning uh, so it's it's very interesting how it worked uh, for the nomad uh, one of my other uh, rants is about the word nomad itself because uh, the word nomad comes from French word no made or something. It's, I don't know how it sounds in, in, in French, but no made means no home. That's the literal uh, translation of the word nomad, no home, homeless. But if you look at a yurt and it's uh, the, 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 the effort they put into building it, the effort they put in decorating it, the uh, sacred interior life of it, the meaning of it, uh, and other functions. How can you call people who used it homeless? I think uh, these are the people who carried their home with them everywhere they went. So <laughs> homeless they were not. They were <laughs> the opposite of homeless. Uh, they had their home with them at all times, and they almost never left it. It's just that they carried it with them. So that's another misconception about nomads as just uh, uh, wandering, homeless, you know, uh, people without any kind of structure, any civilization, uncivilized, bar bar barbaric. But the reality is, it's just a very different mode of civilization. It's just a very different civilization. And we know very little about it. And uh, this video series and my other video series are devoted to at least start, you know, opening up uh, the, this veil of wrong mythology, stereotypes, erroneous representations of this once great and powerful civilization. Uh, let's take a look 
at uh, what nomadic lifestyle is uh, was in terms of society, social structure. Let's start with one e. Uh, one e would hold one nuclear family household, and that would be uh, parents, their children, uh, who are not unmarried children, and their possessions, and including their cattle and etc. So that's one. Uh, household or one e and that was how historically uh, they uh, they they calculated uh, the amount of population the 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 nomadic census if you will in other words if they ask uh, what's the population of a certain nomadic state or how many subjects uh, does one Han or Kagan ha have, usually it would be counted in the amount of yus or, or yurts. So supposedly, you know, one Han has 50,000 yurts under his rule. And that immediately tells uh, his power because we can compare it to amount of yurts of his neighboring Hans. So that's uh, one e, uh, one household, but put them together, and usually uh, a few yurts uh, uh, put together would form one aul. Aul is like nomadic village, if you will, uh, but it's uh, in in an essence it's an extended family. In other words, once a son reaches uh, uh, his adulthood age uh, his parents would uh, uh, arrange a marriage he would get a wife and he would get his own first yurt uh, and he would get some uh, i mean livestock he would get his first possessions his weapons and so he becomes part of this extended uh, family or aul and one owl could have, you know, from three, four to a dozen or a few dozens of uh, ewes, depending on uh, region, on, uh, on, on natural conditions, on traditions, and etc. So uh, we covered uh, one e and one owl as units of uh, uh, or, or building blocks of nomadic society. Now if we take uh, a look at the next levels, uh, a few owls or extended families or nomadic villages would form uh, what's called Ru. And Ru, ru means uh, tribe or clan. So uh, few, again, one few, few owls or few extended families uh, they are related to each other. It's just uh, more degrees of separation, but they're still relatives. They form tribe or clan called Ru. Now, a few uh, few Rus or few clans would form uh, Taipa. And uh, the closest term I could find is chiefdom. In other words, it's a, it's a um, collection of tribes and clans. It's a much stronger uh, unit. It's a much stronger assembly. And they, uh, they wield much more political and economical and military power. And uh, from Taipa level, if we uh, move one step over, we get what's uh, now referred to as Taipalik Odaga or tribal confederation. In other words, few tribes could form a temporary or permanent confederation where uh, each tribe would be more or less equal, uh, but uh, through an assembly, through a um, 
a, a, a um, sort of nomadic uh, congress or senate called Qurultai. Uh, they would get together and make decisions as many times as necessary. Usually once a year was enough, but if it was something unusual, like war or famine or something, uh, or plague, uh, they could meet more often and make uh, decisions on the go. Now, every so often, uh, the situation required uh, centralized, more centralized, and more uh, faster decision making, uh, more concentrated power. So uh, this Taipalak uh, Odaga, the the uh, tribal confederation, could choose to elect a one ruler, obviously known as Han. This is a common nomadic ruler's uh, name, uh, uh, position. We didn't have kings or uh, emperors, we had Hans. And Han would have, uh, uh, he would have uh, all the powers given to him. He would be an elected chief. Uh, uh, he would he would be a military and political and economical leader of this confederation. Uh, depending on the region and period, uh, their power was either stronger or more limited. Uh, for example, uh, generally speaking, Mongol Hans had more power and more discipline among their subjects than say Kazakh Hans who were who had very weak power and very little uh, uh, very little rights and their subjects were more free and uh, often neglected their 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 duties and very often uh, kind of um, uh, disrespected almost Han's decisions and orders and just <laughs> lived their own life the way they uh, decided and they, the way they uh, thought it was necessary. So it was a constant struggle in, in Kazakh society, unlike in Mongol society. So these are uh, different modes of Han power in, in, in nomadic societies. Now, even on a higher level, sometimes a uh, few uh, Khanates, which is uh, Hanate is a domain ruled by Han or Handak in, in Kazakh, a few Handaks uh, would be somehow willingly or forcibly united even more into a nomadic empire and empire is usually uh, viewed historically in histor histor in historical science as a uh, union of few kingdoms or hanates in, in our case so uh, this is a level of empire now, but emperor in, in nomadic uh, uh, civilization, in nomadic uh, realm, was called Qaghan, and his domain would be called, the empire would be called Qaghanat. So, uh, this is the highest level of power in the no nomadic society, and it didn't exist very often, because to reach there, a lot of work must be done in order to unite all these uh, freedom-loving subjects. So it didn't happen very often in history of nomadic civilization, but it did. For example, Genghis Khan obviously was Khan by status because he united all the uh, all the nations 
all the nomadic no nations uh, and all the uh, all the all the nations and states and confederations and Hanates that were previously ruled by independent Hans were now uh, now became his subjects. So he was he had a status of Kagan or even a super Kagan. Now talking about uh, seasonal migrations, uh, one word I want you to remember is Kush. Uh, Kush means uh, migration, seasonal migration. And uh, the nomads, the proper name for nomads in our native language would be Kushpindlir, Kushpind, which means uh, people who are uh, making Kush, who are moving in Kush fashion. Now, I already mentioned earlier that there were three uh, most common modes of uh, nomadic migration of Kush and that is meridional Kush, vertical or altitudinal Kush, Kush and circular Kush. Uh, let's start with the meridional one. That was uh, most common in Kazakhstan and what it means is that uh, nomads would move from north to south and back. So it was a meridional uh, movement. Not latitudinal, but meridional from north to south and back. And uh, within this type of uh, Kush, we had Kstau, which is winter camp. Uh, then when the winter uh, ends and summer comes, uh, the nomads would move to their Kuktiu or spring camp where they would stay for a while. Uh, this is, uh, these are the areas where the snow would thaw earliest and uh, the earth will open. The, the soil will open and the grasses start growing fast. So the cattle, the livestock, I mean, could uh, quickly regain their weight loss uh, that they uh, had during the harsh winter month. And this is where they would uh, store fat quickly. They would start reproducing. So this was a very happy happy season for, for the nomads. This is where the uh, spring uh, equinox celebration would take place. Uh, I mean, spring solstice uh, celebration would take place called Naurus, uh, known as uh, Nivrus in other nations, in other versions, Naurus, Nivrus which is uh, basically a nomadic new year because uh, it happened in, in March uh, at the Cocteau uh, often and this sig signifies the beginning of new cycle after the harsh winter. And from there uh, nomads would move to Jailau, which is summer camp. And the reason why they were moving north uh, is because once uh, winter, uh, once uh, spring was over, uh, summer starts very fast in uh, in plains in steppe, and the, the very sun warmth that thawed uh, snow and helped uh, vegetation to grow is now killing it and burning it and scorching it. So very often you end up in desert very, very soon. And in order to avoid ending up uh, staying in desert and having uh, all the livestock starving, they had to move north where there were still uh, fresh grasses, fresh meadows, fresh pastures. 
So this uh, seasonal migration is basically chasing these seasonal uh, pastures. And that's the entire meaning of the nomadic lifestyle. We are chasing uh, these uh, uh, retreating pastures. That's, that's what nomadism is. <clears throat> so once they reach the summer camp, which is the uh, northmost most, uh, uh, point of their migration route, uh, by this time it's already uh, the fall is starting and the uh, the sun is not as hot uh, in some areas they even get second harvest of, of, of grass so this is when the nomads uh, start going in reverse moving north uh, south I mean towards their uh, winter camp during, uh, towards the Kstau. And uh, usually they would move and stop somewhere in the middle at Kuzdiu, which is uh, their fall or, or autumn camp. And this was another very happy time because the days were still warm. Uh, it was uh, uh, the period of uh, what, what's called Indian summer in, in, in the United States basically golden uh, golden time of uh, autumn or fall where days are still warm but nights are not as hot the grass is still there the the cattle the livestock is fat and this was the best time of year because this is where uh, all the festives and uh, all the celebrations took place uh, the weddings uh, all kind of rituals and events family events everything took place during this time uh, mostly uh, also they uh, this is when they shaved their uh, their their sheep to collect this uh, so necessary wool for the next season and this is where they would make their felt for their yurts and for their uh, for their uh, felt rugs and etc. Because they were getting ready for winter. Now from uh, Kuzdeu, uh, they moved to their Kstau winter camp, and the reason for that was because uh, for for Kstau, they selected uh, pastures and areas where the grass was still available under snow so that uh, their livestock could eat on this grass, uh, dig it under snow, and thus survive uh, the harsh winter. Also, very often they would send uh, a few members of their family who would uh collect hay and put them in haystacks so that it lasts them through winter and then the winter would start uh, basically uh, uh, not a lot of movement people would be mostly spending time at home uh, because uh, of the snow their movement would be very limited only the strongest horses or camels could go through snow. Uh, there were occasional hunts, but not much going on beside that. So uh, they spent this time fixing and repairing things, building things, and etc. And of course, w watching after their cattle, because this is the time when wolves became very aggressive and hungry. So a lot of work had to be spent uh, protecting their livestock. So that's a uh, uh, meridional Kush uh, in a nutshell. The next one is a vertical or altitudinal Kush. Oh, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, the meridional Kush would be the longest one. Sometimes uh, they cover distances up to 
1500 miles so it's huge or uh, over 2000 kilometers so that's a very long ride it's a very long migration but that's what it took uh, in order to survive uh, these harsh uh, conditions and keep livestock fed chasing these retreating seasonal pastures and at the same time this is when that uh, ecological duty was performed because all these uh, livestock moving chasing these uh, retreating uh, pastures would drop and uh, with their droppings and urine would fertilize the soil so that next year uh, it gets new grass moving to vertical uh, Kush it's very similar uh, in concept uh, meaning that you also get Qstau, Kukteu, Kuzdeu and Jailau except for in this case the movement was um, from plains to mountain plat plateaus because uh, some areas uh, for certain tribes allowed to do that it was sufficient because the higher you get usually the temperature is a lot cooler and so the sun doesn't scorch everything up there so it was efficient to just keep moving uh, your livestock higher and higher uh, to avoid this scorching effect of the sun and then uh, moving back uh, after the apex of summer moving back to the uh, stau camping uh, the difference uh, between the first and the second uh, type uh, meridional and vertical is the distance because for vertical course you don't need as much uh, uh, distance you, you don't have to travel as long distances uh, thanks to this altitudinal drop of temperature it was enough to move 50 70 100 200 miles and that would be enough compare it to uh, 1500 or, or 1000 miles so that that was uh, a lot shorter and finally the circular kush is uh, I'm not very much familiar with this one I just uh, found its mentioning in literature but basically it said that it involved having a permanent base at oasis and then chasing the seasonal grasses around this oasis but how exactly uh, it was done uh, I don't have information right now it looks like uh, it was less common than the first two at least in, in Kazakhstan where I live uh, so this image represents the modes of uh, the seasonal kush migration you can see on the left is your Kstau winter camp and what's interesting about it is that this is the only camp that would have permanent uh, buildings and structures basically a winter house uh, made of uh, mud bricks it's a mud house very similar to Central Asian architecture uh, so family would stay uh, mostly in inside of it but in the yard they would usually put their best yurt the biggest the most beautiful yurt and it would be just standing there so this image right there represents the Kastau uh, best as a place where nomadic architecture in form of uh, yurt uh, ger, y meets uh, uh, permanent architecture or, or settled architecture in form of mud house and all other uh, camps Kukteu, Jailau, Kuzdeu are just uh, fully 100% nomadic they would take uh, their light possessions with them leave uh, all the unmovable stuff in the 
Kstal actually dig them, uh, dig holes and put them there, hide it there. And then they would just travel light throughout the year until they come back again and, and can live in a more comfortable conditions. Now, uh, this final image shows Kazakh yurt types and its modes because, as I said, uh, everything about nomadic lifestyle, technology, architecture is uh, transformable. The yurt is a transformer, and this just shows other uh, types and modes of it. For example, the big uh, yurt on the left is called Orda or Ak Orda. And that's a headquarters yurt. It's a it's a yurt of the uh, head of a household of a sen of a of a senior patriarch and his wife. That's their house, and it's the center of their aul or even their ru or or tribe. Uh, Next to it, sometimes they would put what's called konak i or a guest house, guest i. This is when the guests would arrive. They would live uh, in this designated konak i. When a new family was formed, when a son got married, father would put his otau i or newlyweds house. It was uh, a small moderate size house with only a minimal um, set of possessions and furniture uh, basically a life starter kit and uh, this new family it was expected to grow their wealth over the years until one day when they grow older they can afford their own akorda so these are just a few uh, types of yurt and uses. There were much more, of course, but uh, I didn't want to cover everything in this video because it's already getting too long. Uh, now the modes of a yurt. I'll quickly cover that. First one is yurt without shanrak. In other words, when we don't put a uh, skylight piece in the middle of a roof and we use less kanats or kerege sections so we end up with this much smaller uh, quicker quicker easier assembled type of yurt using the parts from uh, you know regular normal yurt and uh, this kind of yurt would be used mostly during kush when they had to stay overnight or stay for a couple of days, just a quick one so that they, they don't have to assemble an entire thing. Uh, the second one is another another mode, another traveling mode when they use Shanrak and Uk, uh, but they don't use Kerege and Yesik. So it's basically just taking top part of a yurt and assembling it separately, covering it with top felt, a uh, piece of felt. And it could st uh, serve as one a day, uh, one night, overnight, uh, little tent. The third one is a variation of it without shanrak, where we only use uh for the uh, roof poles. And uh, again, it's a traveling mode, a quick one. And this is uh, uh, what I mentioned earlier when I said that the tipi or chum, chum uh, type of uh, dwelling survived to these days, because this is exactly the same principle. We, we just use poles, uh, put them in a cone shape, cover it with felt, and that's it. It's done. It's ready to go. It's not, a, it's not an ideal situation, but... It's much better than just uh, sleeping under open skies. It could be a quick shelter. Now, the fourth one is another uh, mode. 
is when you put two sections of kerrige, it's kind of like a card house, and then you cover it with uh, something, a felt, a rug, and you can uh, put another rug inside of it, and there you go, you have your tent. This could be just, a, say, a lunch stop uh, uh, tent or overnight tent. This is the probably the fastest uh, mode of a tent using yurt parts. Doesn't take any effort at all, but at the same time provides for cover, uh, shelter from sun or precipitation. So it's a very quick and good one. So that concludes this section, this video, uh, where we talked about uh, what uh, yurt and uh, its role within the nomadic lifestyle is and what nomadic lifestyle is by itself. And I think we have only one more video left. So I ask you to stay with me a little more and we will conclude this series of videos and I will see you in the next one. Thank you for staying with me.